Good morning and welcome. This is the Wood Couture podcast live at Hakor Red Office, Middle East, Africa, India, and Turkey. In today's episode, we have a very special guest, the one and only Shabazz Tiavara. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome to you, actually. We are here thank in you. our beautiful office. So thank you for, uh, for the invitation to that great podcast. Thank you for hosting us. It's, um, your coffee tastes wonderful. Well, cheers. The place is amazing. It's, uh, we, we, we will, of course, offer a very good Italian coffee for a great Italian friend. So oh. feel welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, l- let's dive into that because uh, obviously y- you've been in, um, in the industry for more than 11 years. And, uh, and, uh, and what I discovered about you is that you actually have a degree in international supply and logistics. So yeah. you are uh, a true procurement professional. You know, I mean, uh, com- when we compare it to the industry wide. And uh, where do you all started? Where, where is Shabazz coming from? Wow, that's, that's, a, that's a deep question. Um, look, Filippo, uh, indeed, I'm in the industry almost for 15 years now. And, and where did that start? It actually started in Spain. Uh, actually started in Spain uh, when I was a very young, uh, young student, uh, going there not for procurement or, or logistics, but actually for marketing. Uh, everything started in marketing, um, in, in a great resort in Mallorca. Um, and, uh, and yeah, get in love with the, um, with the hospitality industry, a fantastic industry, great people, and I think this is where all, um, all started. 15 years later, I'm here in Dubai, um, in this uh, fantastic organization, looking after uh, 400 hotels. Like you say, we cover today uh, Middle East Africa, and since a couple of months, we al- also cover India and Turkey. Uh, and in terms of new projects, we have 150 projects to come, so this is absolutely a big region to cover. But uh, it's quite interesting because um, people that are watching us, our audience, and uh, in the thousands from all over the world, is uh, they see you. You know, I mean that you you rose to vice president position in an organization that, and you have a region that you cover almost two billion people. <laughs> so it's massive, yeah. absolutely massive. What is the secret to reach this seniority? You know, I mean, uh, what is the secret for well, a young graduate? What's I your <laughs> advice? I don't know if there is a if there's a secret. I think uh, there's a mix of a lot of different elements, but. Uh, definitely the passion for the industry. I think this is, this is a human industry, this is a people industry. Uh, you need to love the industry if you want to perform in it. That's for me the, 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 first, the first thing. Uh, we deal with a lot of people, we deal with a lot of, of countries. The passion for traveling, uh, the passion for discovering, the passion for uh, working with different cultures. Just in this office we have more than 40 different nationalities. Uh, I, think, I think this is very true in this industry especially here in, uh, here in Dubai. Uh, it's just the passion and then uh, I guess uh, hard work and a little bit of chance to meet the right people uh, at the right moment, yeah. You, you talk about love. Has hospitality only been in your heart or when did you discover that hospitality is the direction you want to take? Well, you know, it, it, didn't, um, it didn't come like that. I mean, like I've said, uh, the, the, the first experience in Spain was just fantastic because you're in this massive resort welcoming people from, from all over the world. And I think this is, this is how, it, uh, how it started. Um, I've always um, loved the product, a passion for the product. Uh, whenever you go somewhere, you enter in a room, the first thing you do when you get in an hotel room is like discovering everything. What are the amenities, the towers, the furniture? And I think the passion for the product made me want to, to work in that industry. Uh, in order not only to experience it as a guest, but also as a professional, to source and look for the right, uh, the right product to make my guest happy. So how, how do you find time for yourself? Because um, you know, I mean, uh, you're very in a senior, massive senior position. You cover one of the biggest regions, you know, again, <laughs> close to two billion people and uh, uh, multiple brands, large teams, you know, I mean, uh, how do you organize yourself? How do you find time for your own things? Well, I think this is, this is a question for my wife, actually. She, <laughs> she's probably happy that the past, uh, the past 12 months, we've been traveling a bit less, uh, unfortunately, because of, of the pandemics, but at least, at least for, from a family perspective, it was good to be, to be, to be home. Uh, h- how do I find time? Look, it's all about organization and priorities. Uh, like you've said, we cover a lot of brands. Today, our core in the Middle East is uh, more than 28 brands in 41 countries. Uh, so it is definitely a lot of brands, a lot of new cool brands, I have to say, 
um, all our new lifestyle segment, uh, SBE, SLS, Mondrian, 25 hours. This is just so cool to work in that environment. I mean, it's just, uh, it's just passion, like I've said before. Um, so yeah, time, time is, is, is limited, but it's up to uh, having the right people around you and, and focus on the right priorities. So uh, I'm going to touch upon um, some of the brands you mentioned, you know, I mean, and, and talking about lifestyle. And, uh, uh, and also, you, uh, if I understand correct, behind a great man like you, there is always a great woman. So I will touch about that point also <laughs> le later on. But I want to take you back to, your, uh, to the core of, of, of the job, which is a very fascinating part, procurement. Yeah. You know, in the industry, the word procurement is, for some reasons, is people associated with disorganization, lack of transparency, how, how do you balance people's opinion and actually doing a professional job? Yeah. Well, I think um, it's all about delivering um, the expectations. Uh, if, if you look at the organization today, 60% of the new hotel we sign are with existing owner, existing client. So when we engage into a relationship, into a new contract with them, it's for the next 20 years. And if it goes well, we're going to sign more and more contracts. So for me, the way I, I, I see procurement is really um, delivering the right support to my owner, not from the moment the hotel opened, but actually much earlier from the design phase where I can actually bring a lot of added value to my owner by putting together the right people. And the right people will be internally our development team, our design and technical team, and externally, you'll have the suppliers, you'll have the designers, uh, you'll have all the log logistic stakeholders. So I think my job is actually to connect all these people and try from the really beginning to make the right plan, the right execution, and deliver. And I think when you do that, everyone is super happy, and then you work on the next project. You know, it's a, it's a, 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 I must admit, and uh, I have a, a nice quote from you in here, from 2013. Oh, on, on one no, I'm scared. What no, did I no, say? No, no. <laughs> no, nothing bad. Actually, I, I have to pay you a compliment because uh, you are very consistent. And uh, uh, Otelli Middle East asks you, how do you select a new supplier? And, and your answer is, and, and then is, um, is, is beautiful. Everything starts with our guest and their satisfaction, which you just repeated basically, yeah. you know, eight years ago, what you just told me now. So you are super consistent. Yeah. And, uh, and the second is the supplier that can anticipate the market and the one that had the most value. So I, I can see from your answers, you know, your consistency and your dedication to make pro yeah. procurement, you know, I mean, simple, transparent, and forward thinking. But I have a question for you that, that y you mentioned now. Um, uh, bringing you in at the very beginning of the process. You know, we had many interviews and, uh, and uh, we spoke about value engineering in some of our recent interviews. But there is a mix of opinions. There are some that see coming in at the very beginning mm. and add the value. And there are some that say it's a waste of time because anyway, you know, it's too early. What, what's your views on these two kind of answers? Well, I think um, different clients, different expectation, and, and we, fully, we fully appreciate that. Um, but if we look at where we're coming from as, as Accor, and I'm gonna focus on Accor here for a minute, we used to be not only an operator, but also an owner. Accor used to uh, own and operate more than 1,000 properties, mainly in Europe, but not only, uh, also in this part of the world and in, uh, and in Asia. So as an owner, we had obviously to think everything from the beginning because we were owning the asset. Uh, it was our own financial investment. So we had to think how to optimize uh, all the process in order to optimize the budget and, and make sure we deliver product as per expectations. So I think that that DNA of an ex-owner, even though today we operate an, an asset light model, we still have that in our DNA in order to support, again, from the really beginning, 
the owner, because as an ex-owner ourselves, and to be honest, we still own some assets, uh, we want to make sure we advise properly the owner on their investment. So today, the investment is not ours, but we and I pro pro for procurement consider it's my job and my team's job to advise properly the owner on how to invest properly uh, uh, from the really beginning. So I'm not saying we're going to step in everything, of course. Uh, you'll have technical people, you'll have the designer, but from the moment the design has been completed, this is where we, along with the designer, can work on what will be the right supply chain in order to optimize the budget and avoid what you've just described, the late value engineering, which doesn't really bring any value apart from uh, sometimes butchering the design and not bringing the right, uh, the right product for the guest. So I think from my perspective, being involved at the really beginning uh, of, the, of the process is really helping put everything together in order to deliver a successful project. So it sounds like that, you know, if I understood correct, is that experience in owning property and owning the process and, uh, and uh, uh, ex you know, knowledge of how the process goes uh, render you very comfortable in stepping in at the very early stages, if I understood correct. Mm -hmm. So uh, for those people out there that says, hey, I think coming in early stages of design is not necessary, do you think there is uh, a necessity for an educational process in the industry to, to educate people or the mm -hmm. benefit of? Uh, well, li like I've said, I mean, it's different client, different expectation, and, 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 and we, we respect all the organization we work with. Uh, but from my opinion, the most successful projects we've delivered were the one where we were indeed uh, involved at, at early, uh, early step of the, of the project. And, and I think this is really putting everyone together and also avoiding um, misunderstanding. Uh, I'll give you an example. If, if you want to uh, design um, a Ferrari, but then you have the budget for BMW, you're going to struggle to match it. If from the really beginning, you know you have a budget for a BMW, then you're going to design and, and budget the right, uh, the right uh, element and then it's going to be much easier to source the product in line with that, with that design. So I think, um, apart from the budget element, there's also the risk management of supporting the client on the right sourcing strategy. Because at the end of the day, uh, um, we are in a region where a lot of items will be produced in Asia, in Europe. The local industry is improving here, so we'll also have a, a local, uh, local uh, production here. But you will still need to work from the real beginning of having the right sourcing and, and supply chain strategy in order to reduce the risk during the project. Last year, during, during COVID, in, in a minute, all borders are closed. All the Chinese factory are closed. And then we have to think, how can we still deliver the project that are being, being uh, managed uh, with having a different, a, a different supply chain and a different sourcing strategy? And I think the beauty of, of Accor having so many people in the world, well, more than 250 people in more than 20 countries, uh, uh, supporting the client and having the right supply, uh, supply strategy really help us be ready. So you can really uh, anticipate this if you work along with your client from the really beginning. So you, you mentioned during COVID about the situation with China, but now it's the reverse. China actually is full on, you know, yeah. I mean, double digit growth in the country and the speed of growth is fascinating when compared to other regions where uh, there is a lot of supply, they have lack of materials, they, they are still in mm. partial shutdown. So how do you approach your sourcing strategy, you know, I mean, uh, and uh, how comfortable do you feel about China? Uh, in, in terms of manufacturing capability and uh, and also, uh, you know, advising client on sourcing from China. Yeah. Well, look, um, I think, like many countries, I mean, you have you have the best and you have the worst. So you have fantastic factories in China. I've visited myself dozens of uh, of factories, and and some are absolutely beautifully managed. The latest equipment, the right level of management. So I, I think. Uh, in China, you will find you will find everything, and and so is Europe. To be honest, or, or Turkey, uh, you will find the best, and you will find the worst. So for me, it's not so much 
uh, where it's coming from. It's working with the best from everywhere. And this is, this is really what we try, we try to do at, at ACO. And I'm, I'm, I'm focusing on, on Europe, uh, uh, Asia, but we also have in the region, in Turkey, in Egypt, uh, in Morocco, uh, fantastic, uh, fantastic supplier as well. So my strategy is really to work with the best from everywhere. And, and why that? For a simple reason, um, when we open hotels in all these different countries, most of the expectation from our client will be to try as much as possible to work with local manufacturers, which I fully understand. I mean, tomorrow you open an hotel in, in Ethiopia or, or, or in, in the UAE. Um, I understand an investor in that country want to try to work with local manufacturers. So it's going to be my job and my team's job to look, visit, assess, evaluate the right company in all those different locations. And that leads us to another topic, which is uh, sustainability. Um, I do believe moving forward will have less and less long distance supply chain. Um, China is here, China is very, very strong, uh, but we see more and more uh, improvement in terms of manufacturing capabilities everywhere in the world. So I think moving forward, uh, and this is not in the next two years, uh, Filippo, this is really 10, 20 years, I really believe we'll have regional capability of manufacturing for the different, uh, for the different locations. And, and we see it here. I mean, in, in the Middle East, if you look at 15 years ago, uh, everything was imported. Today, I'm, I'm very proud to say a big part of the, the purchases we do for our project here are actually coming from, from that region, and that keeps improving. So this is a trend I'm, I'm, I'm seeing, and I think this trend will keep, uh, will keep uh, improving. You mentioned sustainability, and uh, there is a lot of uh, industry that progress that agenda uh, rapidly and proactively. And um, how do you feel the hospitality is doing in, in general uh, about sustainability and corporate social responsibility compared to other industries? Well, like I've said in the beginning, I mean, we're in the people industry. I mean, uh, we have, we have uh, hundreds of thousand employees all over the world. And I think the um, sustainability and corporate social responsibility is something that's at, at the heart of, uh, of what we do. Uh, at Hacker, we have started a long time ago having a sustainable program to really incentive our property to, uh, to consume green and to, to produce green and to offer a green experience to our client. Um, there is different level of maturity. Uh, I would say Europe is probably uh, in advance versus other, uh, other market. But we really see now a strong, uh, it's not a trend anymore. I mean, it was a trend a long time ago, but now it's, it's not a trend. It's just in the DNA of, of what we do, our, our guests our guest are actually more curious, more demanding. They want to understand what they consume. They want to know that the, the guest amenities they're going to take a shower with are, uh, have been produced in a, in a green uh, factory. They want to know what they eat. And, and I think that um, expectation from the guest is actually forcing us to think how can we go one step forward into, into sustainability. And again, that starts from the way we conceive the building, that, that the way we're going to actually uh, build the hotel, the equipment will have to come from, from the right factories, up to the operation of the hotel, where again, the sustainability will be a very important part of the, uh, of the guest uh, promise. It's quite interesting what you said, that for a core, it was a trend a long time ago. Now it's part of the DNA. Yep. And uh, so, can we say that a core is ahead of the industry in terms of sustainability and CSR? Look, I, I don't know if we are uh, ahead of the industry, but uh, we, we want to lead that industry. Uh, uh, and and in, that, in that, if I can call it, uh, battle for sustainability, I'm more than happy to have everyone along with us. Uh, uh, it's, it's not just ACOR, I mean, our, our, our colleagues are, are also engaged into sustainability initiatives. Uh, ACOR is for a very, very long time, but I think this is something we all collectively need, uh, need to go for. I mean, uh, uh, we've just uh, launched our um, elimination of uh, single plastic use by end of 2021, meaning uh, uh, from 2022, our guests won't have any more plastic bottle in the, in the room. Uh, we will not have any more the small plastic bottle in the, in the room. It will be replaced by a dispenser. I think this is strong uh, a commitment and big changes in our industry. And that's just the beginning. I really, really see that those things are improving. 
uh, increasing and again starting from the guest our guest wants to experience more and more green stay in our hotel so this is really going in the right in the right direction so uh, if we dig deeper into the the notion that you mentioned before about lifestyle brand obviously our core before the formal announcement of the uh, get the acquisition or joint venture, whatever is the form, with any small capital to create this lifestyle powerhouse. You know, you've got what, 12, 16 brands only on lifestyle, and uh, you had, you know, before you had already So by Sofitel, Mama Shelter, 25 Hours, these are your own breed, you know, with people that you collaborated and, or absorbed into a core. The question I have is this How has this lifestyle changed the way you do procurement? That's a very good question. Um, I think before getting into lifestyle, the, the industry used to have a very strong standard like 15, 20 years ago. So uh, by standard, I mean almost copy-paste products, uh, which back then was an expectation from the guest. We had the exact same Novotel room in Shanghai, in Paris, or in Sao Paulo. Uh, but step by step, we understood the guest wanted uh, a more local experience uh, still they love the brands they decide to stay at so we still promise uh, the guest experience from the different values of that brand it doesn't mean each hotel has to be copy paste so over the past 10 15 years we've seen this uh, this reduction in terms of uh, of standard uh, especially from a design perspective and the product will still be strong you will still have the exact uh, uh, guest uh, experience we promise, but from a design perspective, we've seen a lot of different evolution uh, depending on the region, depending on the, on, the, on the different brands. That leads us to lifestyle brands too, they where uh, the guest wants different level of experience. And the same guest might want a certain experience when he goes to work during the week with his colleague and the weekend with his family and children. So we really uh, um, started to uh, look into this, this lifestyle environment and, and today I'm very proud to say that it's a strong, uh, um, it's a strong part of, of Accor brands and we're going to keep increasing this number of brands. There was a fantastic coverage of um, Accor uh, as a powerhouse of lifestyle brand and, uh, and one of your colleagues, Ijit Sejin, I think is, uh, you know, if I can pronounce it correctly, yeah. And uh, he's saying everything from brand experience to product to design to social media requires very specific skills and mindset. Mm -hmm. The question I have for you is how has this l led you or, or brought you to uh, select a new supply chain to cater for this uh, lifestyle brand, or have you kept the same people you were using before? Yeah. What, what has happened in the transition? Well, it's it's a very good question, and and I think, uh, like I've said before, the the right coordination with the designer will lead to delivering the right lifestyle product. So for me, going into this lifestyle environment starts really from coordination between the designer, our own design technical team, and the suppliers. To go into the direction of, of suppliers, I don't think we have really changed our, our supply chain, but it's probably our supplier, like I've said before, in 2013, had anticipated that this is the direction of the business. So they uh, acquire the right machinery, they have uh, changed their own organization in order to be able to work on high-end product but probably smaller quantities. Like I've said, we will not anymore produce uh, X million sofas for 200 hotels. It's going to be a bespoke production for an hotel of 200 or 300 rooms. So the supplier have uh, anticipated it and they understand that now whatever production they will have to do will be bespoke for one property and probably not replicable to another, uh, another property. I think what has changed, Filippo, uh, from our suppliers, not so much the supply chain itself, but the digital systems. Uh, I think the digitalization, it's a word we use a lot in our industry, is very important to optimize efficiency, to go faster, 
to avoid traveling uh, 10,000 kilometers and visit the factory five times until you have the right product. A lot of things can be done remotely. So I think the supplier that we work very well with are also the one that have invested into digital capabilities in order to optimize the whole, uh, the whole process of supply chain. So then uh, we can confirm what your colleague said that, we, that you need a very specific skill and mindset to support you know, a lifestyle powerhouse, you know, like a core. And uh, you talk about digitization. Do you think virtual reality is the future for product rather than simply doing the old ways, you know, no. hey, traveling, going inspecting the prototype and back? What do you think? Well, I, I think it's never black or white. At the end of the day, the, the, the human impact is key in our industry. So we don't aim to completely eliminate any human interactions. But I do believe, and in that, that example is very true, that uh, virtual reality can, again, help us to accelerate and reduce certain steps of traveling and go visit the product. Uh, if you want to review a mock-up room, instead of going four times, maybe you'll go only two times, and then two other times will be managed through virtual reality. So I'm, I'm a strong believer into technology. I really believe technology can help us uh, be more uh, efficient, but doesn't mean the technology is going to replace uh, the, the humans because we will still need to meet, to physically discuss, to touch, to feel. I mean, the industry is about emotion. If you don't see the product, a part of the, of the, of the, of the industry is killed. So for me, touching the product to experience it is still very important. Uh, now the technology to get there is still important as well. You, you said something uh, which is fascinating there. You said uh, 13 years ago, you know, you could manufacture cut and paste, a cookie cutter product and you go fast. Today we have lifestyle brand, which is every design is unique. We can say, you know, even the same SLS brand in different locations is completely different hotels, you know, and, uh, and, um, and um, you need suppliers that go uh, a, a different mindset, you know. But we all know that FFE, you know, particularly furniture, is according to industry expert, is the single biggest cause for project delays. So my question is, if with the cooking cutting scenario, we had project delays, now we have these brands that are unique and uh, you know, require even more attention, details, technology, and human interactions. Uh, how can, are we gonna have more delays or is it the same story? <laughs> what, 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 well, what do you think you know, <laughs> the industry will like, face? I, I don't think the delays come from the product or the design of the, of the hotel. I think the delays come from a wrong planning, a wrong execution, and probably a wrong organization in, in general. So uh, I don't believe the, um, the lifestyle environment will need three years to open instead of two. Uh, it's actually the opposite. I really believe uh, now having a different organization, you can reduce the whole uh, lifetime of a project by working properly since, since the beginning. So yes, there is a unicity in the design of lifestyle, that's absolutely key. Uh, it requires working with the right supplier that can produce uh, the exact specification the designers have put together, so having the right supply chain. But if, if you have the right organization and you do work with the right suppliers, we have also an operational understanding. Because at the end of the day, the design will uh, uh, evolve in a live environment when people will sit on the chair, might drop on the bed, will will work on the on the desk. So you also need to anticipate this design will have to be operational. And the suppliers who understand that operational element usually help us to uh, sometimes rework a bit the specification and again reduce the risk of delay because this has not been anticipated before. So for me, it's absolutely key to work with the right suppression, but also having the right coordination from the beginning with, uh, with the different stakeholders. Yeah. Have you seen more bespoke design or applied to the lifestyle uh, brand project? Or is it the usual that you were seeing seven to 10 years ago, you know, 
branded product, you know, just a place in the right context. You know, how, how do you see, how do you think, you know, th this kind of material specification has changed in your opinion, you know, in, uh, in the project you've seen in general? Yeah, well, I think, uh, again, you, 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 you have uh, different designers working on different products, so it's difficult to, uh, to categorize or to say uh, one, one fits all. Uh, what I feel is the, uh, the FFNE, the design, is a, is a strong and strongest element the guests are focusing on. So we are uh, really trying to work with the best designer. Best doesn't mean the, the most renowned, but best meaning the people who have this capability to bring the right creativity for a certain brand or a certain experience we're trying to, to deliver to our guests. So definitely I see uh, uh, stronger creativity probably doesn't mean we take branded product we put in a room just mean that having so many different brands with different uh, uh, different DNA different standard different uh, expectation you want to give to your guest we need to bring the right designer that will have the capability to reproduce it is a uh, lifestyle synonymous with primarily with luxury or no, just lifestyle no no absolutely not. why I is think, that I think if you look at our uh, Joe and Joe concept Joe and Joe is an economic concept we have developed in Europe, and now we are expanding the brands very successfully all over the world. We have in, in Rio, in Brazil, uh, we are working on some Joe and Joe in, in, in Asia. Uh, it's an economy brand with, again, a certain uh, element of design, very modular, when you can uh, adapt the room the way you want. So I think this is absolutely fitting into our lifestyle portfolio while being an, an economy brand. So I don't believe lifestyle and luxury are, are necessarily going together. I do believe lifestyle, uh, uh, lifestyle experience can go from eco to ultra luxury, absolutely. So what this, uh, there is a lot of <laughs> product to focus on and a lot of design, you know, and it's incredible. So what do you do when you lose focus? What is Shabazz doing when they say, hey, I have a moment that I can't concentrate? What's your technique to regain your... <laughs> <laughs> no, no. If, you <laughs> if you ask me, I will tell you I, I'm going for a long run and, uh, and <laughs> it's been tough the past year, <laughs> the past <laughs> months. So now definitely uh, trying to, uh, to do sports, trying to, uh, trying to just... It's been, it's been uh, difficult the past, the past 12 months, but travel. I mean, uh, travel is a passion, so just, just traveling to uh, different regions, different countries, cities is helping you your brain to, uh, to discover a new thing. And, and, and I think it's uh, very important to, to always uh, be aware of what's happening in the world to, uh, to keep the focus, yeah. Any strange habits that we don't know about you? Um, I'm French, so we have a lot of French <laughs> habits, There's a lot of, <laughs> lot of strange <laughs> habits. Uh, no, again, again, if you ask uh, uh, my, my wife, uh, we do stuff with cheese. Uh, and butter and bread that probably no one else does on this on this earth. So from a food perspective, I'm sure you could probably consider that a French habit. Well, you're Italian, so you probably do the same, actually. Yeah, but at uh, least uh, <laughs> I can say you guys have a good coffee, so you know, I'm not <laughs> complaining about that. Yeah, it's, uh, it is good coffee. We know the supplier is a very good yeah. supplier. So y y you mentioned that you're spending more time at home, you know, I mean, uh, due to the, uh, obviously, the lockdown and uh, how the world goes right now, you know, I mean, how is that? has impacted or affected or improved your relationship with your wife? I think at the beginning it was, of course, this big pandemics coming in and we had no clue where this was going. But yeah, the impact and it came like, boom, uh, suddenly you don't travel. So I remember the last trip I was coming back from Nairobi, Kenya, and I didn't think, I didn't know that would be my last trip before uh, 13, 14 months. Uh, so suddenly you feel like the world collapsed and, and everything is, is stopped. And in fact, no, because the technology helped us to um, think new ways of working. And we had to, we didn't have, it was not an option. Suddenly you had to uh, get into your uh, Teams call, Zoom, and, and work with your colleagues. And the beauty of it after a couple of weeks, it worked very well. And you realize projects are moving on, people are available. Uh, we just get used to uh, 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 be behind our screen. Uh, but of course it was, we were first to do it. But we realized uh, we can probably reduce uh, uh, quite a lot the number of trips we've been doing and keep only the essential travels. And, and I do believe 
Uh, at the moment, pandemics is still here, but at some point it will it will resume, but not to the level we used to we used to travel. As a matter of fact, I was I was traveling three to four times a month, uh, sometimes very long distance to go to South Africa, Morocco, China. Uh, um, those trips will come back for sure, but less frequently. Uh, result is you focus, you lose less time in transport, airport control, uh, taxi, your your home, you're at the office. So you just work better. I really feel like um, the amount of project we've been able to manage over the past 12 months, most probably in a normal circumstances, will have taken more time. So definitely optimization, a bit more time at home, that for sure, uh, and, and focus. It's, it's for me, it's a good uh, outcome of the pandemic, definitely. Again, you know, you, you're very passionate about design and, uh, and uh, I mean, you collaborate with thousands of designers all over the world, you know, from the most renowned to the young up and coming. And, uh, and the design industry seems to have progressed the, you know, the gender equality mm -hmm. uh, agenda quite nicely. I mean, the recent Campbell House, Beth Campbell is the CEO, you know, Monica Moser, based out of Paris, is chief operating That's officer. Yeah. So you have Studio Cart in Los Angeles, Robin Cart, this is great. Karin Gardner from KKX, Marcel Wander, another businesswoman. Yeah. So all very big names, and again, all female. Is uh, how is the hospitality industry coping with uh, balancing the art on well, the gender agenda? I think this is much better than what it used to be, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think uh, we are absolutely on the right track. Again, different region, different maturity. Uh, if you look at the Middle East, we have more and more uh, female GM, which is fantastic in Saudi, in the UAE, in Qatar. Uh, so this is really going in the, in the right direction. I agree with you. In the design industry, uh, we are at the very, very uh, good uh, level of, of uh, uh, gender uh, equality. So it's, it's probably an industry we should, we should focus. The industry is, is leading. Uh, at ACOR, we have um, a RISE uh, um, organization which promotes gender equality. And, and I think um, it's interesting because we could think it's, it's a topic that will be led by women. And actually, I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised to see so many men are engaged into, into that cause and, and to see that today we have more and more women willing to work into hospitality. I, I do believe uh, the... Uh, the trend is going in the right direction, and and it's very very positive. Yeah, yeah it's. Um, I mean, I must admit, you know, I'm I'm, uh, I'm uh, incredibly um, happy about particularly our call. You guys have got a global chief development officer. It's a lady also the in charge of procurement, yeah. another female um, uh, colleague. So again, it, it seems that you know, I mean, our call uh, have been, you know leading the way in sustainability, leading the way in corporate social responsibility, leading the way on lifestyle brand. So a lot of, you know, I mean, setting the example in the market rather than following somebody else. Yep. And, uh, and recently, and, and considering that you guys seem to know the trends and where the market is going and where the, the industry is going very well, because you tend to anticipate rather than react. The question I have is, you recently were a speaker at the hotel show in Dubai, and uh, I, I was fascinated by the title of your panel. You know, I mean, it says, New Priorities and Directions in the Stakeholder Landscape. I mean, what was the outcome? What was the discussion about? That was, that was a very good panel. Um, unfortunately, because of social distancing, we could not welcome more people, but it was a very interesting panel made of, uh, um, Asset management, uh, UAE-based, a procurement company really focusing on new projects, and uh, and and myself uh, to represent the operator side. Um, very good discussion, uh, I have to say, about how can we work together better. Again, it's something that I, I, I'm bringing back, but I I, I do believe uh, a lot of. Uh, um, gap in the organization come from lack of communications. And having together around the table, uh, asset owner, asset manager representing the owner, the operator, and a procurement company uh, uh, working on, on, on opening new hotels, was good to bring the uh, different 
vision and expectation we have from from each from each other. Uh, no, in in general, I think we are in an industry that evolves very quickly, especially in that region. If you look at the Middle East, uh, and especially the UAE, within 20 years, this country has completely changed. And sometimes it's just difficult to keep track of these changes uh, in terms of organization, not, not internally, but working with the different stakeholders, procurement company, the, uh, the, the asset, uh, the supplier also. We could have brought a supplier. It would have been super interesting to have also their, their, own, their own opinion. So I think um, having the right coordination and, and communication together usually help deliver a most successful project. That, that for me, the main outcome, it's if you work in silo in your own, uh, in your own department, on your own uh, focus, without talking to, to each other, that's probably a, a way not to fail, but will not optimize the organization to deliver a successful project. Yeah. It's interesting. I, obviously, I'm biased to this uh, question because we are bespoke manufacturers of, you know, I mean, uh, we call ourselves the lifestyle factory. And, uh, uh, but, uh, you know, so, uh, but I, I want to ask you, you mentioned they should have brought a supplier into the discussions. Mm -hmm. But my question is, why is it the suppliers are always left out from these discussions? Well, if you ask me, I would have brought them. Uh, no, of course, you know, and, uh, and that's great to hear. But uh, organizers, uh, they see uh, supply as a vendor. And uh, uh, wh where is the added value that a supplier can bring to the discussion? Look, uh, I think we, we uh, speak a lot of uh, innovation. Um, and innovation is a way to lead the industry by bringing something new. And, and as head of procurement, for me, it's just vital to always bring the right innovation to my guest. And the innovation is not something I will invite myself with my team in our office. The innovation will come from speaking to the supplier. Uh, and we've seen it over the past 12 months. Because of COVID, unfortunately, or actually fortunately in that case, a lot of uh, contactless technology have come into the market to uh, pay without bringing your credit card, etc. And I think this kind of crisis can bring actually innovation to change the way we use the product, uh, the way a new technology could make your stay uh, more pleasant. So for me, and, and I wish I, could, I would have more time to do it, visiting the factory, having a strong relationship with the suppliers is the way to always keep being updated of the right innovation happening in the industry. And those innovation will then be able to pass either to the designer, to our own technical team, to our IT team, in order to bring that innovation and see how we can again improve, improve the product. So all innovation come from the, from the supplier. Those, those suppliers are the expert of their product, of their service, and hence why I, I do think having supplier involved in this kind of discussion is absolutely key to always being able to, to innovate. So basically, when you, somebody wants to put together a menu, designing a menu, bring in a chef. It tells you how you can make it. Yeah, that's uh, right. So I, I get the analogies. I want to ask you, is there, in your opinion, uh, processes or behavior or things that the industry in the procurement environment doing now that in five to ten years' time are likely to disappear? What do you think, or they will not do it anymore? What do you think is going to be something that might change radically in the next five to 10 years? Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, again, it's difficult to, to, to categorize. Uh, but I, I, I think the, um, the role of procurement uh, is not just to have a list of things to buy and go buy it. I mean. Uh, some people do it in the market, but I think it, it doesn't bring any, any value. And like I've said before, a lot of projects we are currently signing uh, come from existing clients. So if you do the right thing, most likely the owner, the client, will be happy to work again with you on the next, on the next project. So I think the, the way procurement is evolving is really to bring added value to the project, not just be the guys that take an order and go buy it somewhere. So I, I think that that is going to evolve, and the best procurement agent, procurement organization, will be the one successful tomorrow. At the same time, it's a topic we've, we've touched before, it's value engineering. I, I think this, this late value engineering in the projects that are not bringing much 
uh, value to the project is likely to disappear moving forward. I, I really believe, uh, again, the, the, the client, the uh, organization who understand working together from the beginning uh, is bringing more value than doing uh, very late value engineering into the project. I think this is a trend that will probably keep decreasing. We see it already, but moving forward, it's going to keep decreasing. Normally we do it at the end, but this deserve a COVID high five <laughs> for the answer because we, we, we sympathize with the answer and we, we truly believe the value engineering has to disappear. You anticipate it will disappear, which we love you. One final question that I have for you and, uh, and uh, if I take a massive giant, let's call it, you know, canvas, yeah. white canvas and I put it on top of Burj Khalifa, what message would you write there? Um, just enjoy every day. I mean, uh, we're so lucky. We work in a fantastic industry, great country. Just, just enjoy. I mean, uh, the the past months have been tough, man. Uh, away from the family, not being able to travel. Just let's be happy to be here and uh, and keep enjoying. Yeah. Anything you change in the, in the things you do? You know, the, as a result of you know the new normal. Um, I spend more time home. That's for sure. That's for sure, I, I spend more time home. Uh, but no, I, I, I don't think uh, there'll be a massive uh, revolution. I don't believe in revolution. I think the, um, the pandemic has put a strong focus on uh, having a better uh, work-life balance. So that's probably something that I will uh, pay more attention in the future is making sure uh, I spend uh, the right level of time with the people I love and, and be more focused at work with all the projects we have to open. Yeah. So you spend more time with your wife? Yes, at the moment there's a Euro Cup, so it's a bit tough at home. But let's see if, if France or, 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 or England they win. That's going to be a, a big one. <laughs> 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 that is going to be certainly you know, in a very hot uh, um, uh, household. And uh, uh, I don't think there's much more I can say to say thank you very much for being on our show. It's been inspiring and, um, you know, Thank you very much. Well, look, thank you, Filippo. It's been a, it's been a pleasure. Uh, anytime you want to discuss about the industry trends and evolution, that was a great uh, a great show. Thanks. Thank you. Speak to you soon. Thank you.